Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Andrew Oak. He's an author, a speaker, and a documentarian. He also loves animals, good food, and motorcycles. He's a real man's man. But through an assignment he took on when he was a series producer at C-SPAN, he earned himself the nickname the First Ladies Man by becoming the country's preeminent authority on our First Ladies. Those are my words, not his. He's not prone to saying such nice things about himself. He's been on the show before, and it's great to have him back. Co-hosting with Pete on this episode is Jim DeFelice. He's also an author and a very prolific one of nonfiction related to stories that are uniquely American. He, too, has been a guest on the show more than once. Please go back and listen to his episodes. They're terrific. He's got a special curiosity and a way of articulating those historical American experiences that is descriptive and universal. If I'm gushing with admiration, it's because he's also a wonderful guy, and we're lucky and grateful to call him a friend. Anyway, the guys talk about Andrew's book, Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies, and how the occupation of First Lady has no training, no manual, and no paycheck, but a ton of expectations and loads and loads of scrutiny. They talk about Melania and Michelle and being the first social media First Ladies, and a bunch of other stuff. Our longtime listeners already love Jim, and you probably already love Andrew, too. You're going to love him even more. Here's our guest today, Andrew Oak. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell Lepp. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Hello, this is Andrew Oak, the First Ladies Man. Catch me at www.firstladiesman.com, and I'm here with you on the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, indeed. And we also have co-hosting with me, author of West Like Lightning and a whole mess of other books, Jim D. Felice, and, and he's got, gosh, three new things to announce, and we'll do that at some point on this show. But um, yeah, Andrew, thanks for coming on. It's always awesome to have you. You're a Tactical 16 author, so we have to make sure we mention them because we're partnered with them, and they're fantastic. I love your work. And nothing like when you go to high school and you're trying to think of the 11 jobs we always talk about that high school kids can come up with, being the chronicler of the first ladies is, is never one of them. Even if you're like, I'm going to be a writer, how many different kinds of writers there are there? You know, it's so it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on, man. I, I, I dig it. You guys have got to go check out firstladiesman.com, speaking tour, tons of video, all the C-SPAN work that he's done. And listen, any first lady, even the obscure ones, he knows all about them. And so when you have questions, if you have a history report to do, Andrew is the source. So firstladiesman.com, you can follow him on Twitter. He, he's all over the place, constantly on the road. Again, thanks for coming on. Um, tell us what, what's the latest thing that you've been doing. Well, I've been doing exactly what you said. I've been speaking. I've been writing. I've been interviewing. I've been traveling. I've been to some great events uh, from Arizona to Michigan and all points in between. Daughters of the American Revolution, uh, colonial dames of the 17th century, daughters of Jamestown. And I had the distinct honor and privilege of being the commencement speaker this past summer at my former high school. So it's interesting in my introduction when you mention of all the things you could pick in high school, this wouldn't be one of them. Well, that was the that was the thrust of my speech. I yeah. mean, if you had told me in high school that I was going to be the first ladies man, that I was going to chronicle the lives of every first lady from Martha Washington to Melania Trump, that I was going to write two books, that I was become this expert, this 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 authority on this subject matter. I would have laughed I, if you had told me that I was going to be the commencement speaker at a at a future high school graduation. I would have laughed. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't a bad student, but I wasn't up on the stage, you know, as valedictorian either. I was just kind of, you know, I, I had a, I had a lot of friends uh, and I did just fine. And I went to University of Maryland and, and did well there, too. But it just nothing was on my radar. And it's so funny the way life changes your plan no matter what your plan is, and you need to be ready for that, and you need to embrace it because it can take you to all different places that you never thought you would go. And that brings me right here with you guys on the Break It Down show. 
Yeah, well, Andrew, we, you, you know, it, it has been an amazing journey for you. Can you just, just tell us just briefly maybe how you got uh, not only into that subject, but how you started writing in the first place? Because, uh, that, you know, that's a good little story in and of itself. No, great, great question, Joe. I appreciate that. I, I was a television producer that had produced a number of things. I've done 24-hour news. I've traveled with presidents. I'm based out of Washington, D.C., so I'm politically savvy, but I didn't major in uh, you know, government and politics. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a main focal point for me. Um, and I'd done PBS documentaries, ESPN documentaries, short movies, long movies, television shows, you know, the, and when C-SPAN, when I, when I joined that project, it was because I had a friend there who told me that there was a project coming up that might be, might be good for me, um, knowing that I could work hard in the field. And that's what it entailed, taking seven bags of gear and traveling across the country to do all the field work for the series. So to hit all the locations for every first lady, you know, birthplace, uh, uh, cemetery, school, library, church, uh, museum, a- anything that related to these women um, at the time, Martha Washington through Michelle Obama, who was the sitting first lady when the series went out. And I signed on just like I'd signed on for any other project. And I thought it was a great story to be told. I wanted to learn more about these women. It was a group of women that their story had not been widely told. So that that piqued my interest. But they ended up to be so remarkable and so incredible and the study was so intense and with as little resources as we had, I, I, again, I was traveling by myself. There was a, there was a, a, a crew in DC that put the shows together and wrote the shows and booked guests and things like that. But when I was out on the road, I was, I was on my own and I had to conduct the interview, set up the camera, set up the lights, do the site survey, have the questions, know the follow-up questions. And it was, you know, it was either really crush it or, or fail miserably and failure wasn't an option. And at the end of the series, I end up this sort of rain man of first ladies. And there was so much more to tell, so much that was on the edit room floor, so much that didn't make the show that I felt compelled. I felt responsible to share this information about these great women. And that trickled down into books. And as far as starting writing, I just opened up my laptop and started writing about Martha Washington and chronicling my my adventures and my journeys and little tidbits of how television is made and and where I made mistakes and where I made wrong turns and where I made right turns. So it's kind of a travel log and a history lesson all in one. And uh, uh, people seem to be able to relate to that and, and enjoy these women. But, uh, you know, without these women, I wouldn't be the first ladies man. And it's it's their stories that, that drive this first ladies man project and make it so interesting. And, you know, you hooked up with uh, with a pretty unique uh publisher in in certain ways um so why don't you tell us a little bit about how you you know hooked up with with them and why you know their background they're all uh veterans i think they're all veterans or they're they're very into um you know that side of things yeah no that's the way it started out tactical 16 the the president ceo and creator eric shaw was my neighbor in in shadyside maryland and and he and his wife Kristen who is the, the, the VP of, of marketing or uh, uh, design and, and graphics and, and layouts for the books and all. They were the two that started the company um, and, and they were my neighbors and I was a television producer and I wasn't even the first lady. I was, I was so far from being the first ladies man at this point and their story of starting this publishing company. So veterans could tell their stories unedited and, and, and unchanged uh, I thought was just remarkable. So I put them on TV I was just doing my job as a producer in finding a good story, an interesting story, a story that needed to be told, and putting them on 24-hour cable news. And when I did, the publishing company, uh, it just just went crazy. People loved it. People latched on. Their website crashed. People were downloading their books left and right. So when I had a chance to put them on TV again, I did. And we talked about how much more success they were having, and then they doubled that success. So when it came time for me to write a book, I didn't have any uh, uh, publishing deal or publishers knocking down my doors. I just had a great story to tell or great stories to tell. And I, I just for accountability, I threw it out on Facebook. I said, well, I've decided to write a book. And Eric contacted me immediately and said, we would like to publish your book. And I said, well, guess what, Eric? You're number one on a list of one <laughs> publisher that wants to publish me. So you got the job. And, and, and I couldn't be happier about it. Because part of the profits of all of these books on Tactical 16 go right back into the into the company 
and go to help other veterans uh, uh, write their stories and and publish books of their own. And I feel like that's doing my part to give back to the people that that are true heroes and, and, and give us the, the freedom in this great country that we have. And I feel very, very good about that and very, very good about my publishers. I'm honored and, and privileged to be a Tactical 16 author. You know, we, we've gone, I think, 10 minutes or so here. We have not uh, really uh, told people about Andrew's website, which is, uh, first of all, it's a great place where you can buy the books, but also it's a great resource. And, um, you know, not the kids out there should be, uh, you know, copying stuff out of the off the website for their term papers, but uh but it's a great uh, place to, to start to get to know about his book. So, you know, Andrew, why don't you plug that straight for us? Sure. It's uh, firstladiesman.com, F-I-R-S-T-L-A-D-I-E-S-M-A-N.com, firstladiesman.com. And it's basically got a, uh, uh, everything I've done with First Ladies, right down to the C-SPAN series. If you go to the video page, at the top, there's the C-SPAN link that gets you. You can watch any and every show and outtake and side video. And, and C-SPAN does a wonderful job with their website of, of having biographies and, and, and trivia about these first ladies and, and pertinent information about the time in the, their time in the White House, historical information. Every interview, every speech that I've recorded, uh, radio interview, podcast, television interview, uh, uh, things about the current uh, first lady. Melania Trump, uh, television that I've done about uh, Barbara Bush when Barbara Bush passed away, uh, Nancy Reagan when Nancy Reagan passed away. There's um, uh, stuff that I've learned. There's a map that shows you everywhere that I went for my studies. You can pick up the books. There's articles I've written, uh, historical articles, current articles, um, articles with, with anything and everything having to do with the First Ladies. And it does. It covers every single First Lady and or hostess from Martha Washington up through Melania Trump. Volume one is the 1700s through the 1800s, Martha Washington through Ida McKinley. And volume two is uh, Edith Roosevelt, the first first lady of the 20th century, right on up through Melania Trump, right after President Trump was elected. And my thoughts on that. There's even a, a special little side chapter in the Hillary Clinton chapter called What If? And it talks about what if Hillary had won and we had had our first first gentleman who was a former president, which is fascinating to think about. Um, uh, it, it's 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 a it's a remarkable journey that I just had the privilege to use C-SPAN's uh, uh, series and good name uh, to get to all these places to learn all this stuff. And the website, people seem to have a lot of fun with it. So there it is. What happens if Hillary Clinton wins? I mean, how does Bill Clinton as the first gentleman, how, how does that work? Well, that's a, that's a great question, and, and it's 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 it kind of it's a question that took me by surprise. The first speech I did out of uh, uh, the C-SPAN series, and I was on my own as the first ladies' man. I spoke at the Hoover Museum, Presidential Library and Museum in West Branch, Iowa, and I spoke for about forty-five, fifty minutes, and then I took uh, a good uh, half an hour to forty-five minutes worth of questions. It was endless. It was I was flattered, humbled that people would stick around and, and, and ask these many questions. One of the first questions I got was, what are we going to call Bill Clinton if Hillary Clinton wins? And at this point, Hillary Clinton hadn't even announced that she was running. I mean, everyone knew she was she was going to, uh, but it wasn't official. I said, well, here's the interesting thing about that. And I'm only just now considering it because it's the first time anyone's asked me. But we'll call him President Clinton because a president even when he's a former president, is always President Clinton. And I said, this is a very, very unusual situation here where the first first gentleman, that's likely what he would be called, will be a former president. And then in Hillary Clinton's case, think about how many times we saw Hillary Clinton and President Clinton in the same room when she was senator or when she was secretary of state. It was almost never. Yeah. He's off doing his own thing. And he's, uh, you know, a former president and giving his speeches and the Clinton Foundation and everything else. And Hillary Clinton's got her own uh, career and own stuff going on. And look, Hillary is a smart lady. And, and Bill Clinton is a smart man. You put the two of them together in the room at the same time. And that's a power struggle, Wh whether whether you whether you you openly recognize it or whether you strive for it or strive against it. If I'm the president of France and I walk into the Oval Office and there's President Hillary Clinton and President Bill Clinton, you don't know which one to talk to because you've had a you've had a relationship with President Bill Clinton before. 
but now it's President Hillary Clinton. So if Hillary Clinton is the smart woman that she is, that we know she is, she would have Bill Clinton as far away from the White House and as far away from Washington, D.C. as possible. She'd find a position for him or he'd be almost like a, a, a de facto uh, uh, deputy secretary of state. And he's wildly popular on the world stage. And he could go and do a lot of good outside of the U.S. And she honestly wants him as far from her as possible so she can cut her own image as President Hillary Clinton. And, I, and I that sense means a lot of a television show coming up here. <laughs> the yeah, but, but, of but, first gentleman. 100%. So, so, you know, if, if Carly Fiorina had done better, we would have had a more, more of a sense of, of what a true first gentleman will be like because Frank Fiorini, Fiorina uh, uh, was not a, a, a president or a politician before, and he would be a, a true spouse of a president that Bill Clinton could never be because he will always be President Clinton. You know, we, we kind of take for granted, you know, that, that, you know, first lady is in the news and newsworthy and, and stuff. But has that really kind of evolved over the over time? I mean, was first was being first lady always a thing? I mean, when did when does that happen historically? That, that That's that's another great question. And, and I don't know that it's ever been asked to me that way. That's very, very interesting. First lady was a thing from the very beginning. It, it really was. Martha Washington was the wife of the man who was leading the revolution against the British Empire. That, whether she wanted it to be or not, was a role, a position of prominence, and, and, and everyone knew who she was. Uh, she went to nearly every winter encampment of the, of, the, uh, of the Revolutionary War at the request of her husband. Her husband wrote in letters that he didn't think clearly without his wife at his side, and she, he needed her there. And that's very interesting because I'm old enough to remember when – President Reagan said publicly, I don't make a single decision without running it by Nancy. And, and the press had a field day with it. They, they, they said, we didn't elect this woman. This is not the right thing to do. But, but what people don't realize is that these women are partners in leadership. They have been from the very beginning. And Martha Washington established just from life experience, from being a prominent woman in a prominent household, her first husband, uh, Daniel Park Custis, left her so wealthy and in such a social standing that she was a woman of, of great wealth and great prominence, which would have attracted young General Washington to her. Um, and and, and it's, it's remarkable to think direction and the, the partnership in leadership that these women have had right from the beginning. And it rolls right into Abigail Adams. Abigail Adams gave her husband political advice, career advice. She was uh, a woman of remarkable intelligence, uh, a progressive thinker, even in today's standards, uh, when it comes to race and gender and religion. These women are very, very capable women, even more so in, in the first two centuries of our country, because women with this natural intelligence, women with this social standing and this aptitude who still couldn't vote who still couldn't own land, who were not formally educated, they would gravitate to these men who would become president because that's the only way they could get their views out and give their contributions to society that they had uh, uh, no choice but to give, given given their, their level of intelligence. A great point with the uh, the whole conferring with your spouse. I mean, in, in when when the traditional first lady relationship is there, you know, that person is the other half of you and oftentimes the better half of us. Right. And at least you know, being president is hard. You're often picking between 15 different horrible options and you're trying to make the best of that situation. And you need that other perspective to, to, you know, to be the better person that you are with your partner. And it's kind of funny that we would look down upon that, you know, because they got to where they were. You know, the president gets there because of, of who their spouse is in part, because they are a great team in terms of how they how they present things. That That's interesting. And, and I also wanted to go back to um, we were talking with uh, Jack Brennan the other day. His his show probably will be out just before this. But he was the military chief of staff during President Nixon's uh, presidency and then his actual full chief of staff afterwards. But during his presidency, you know, all of the military decisions that the president wanted to make in terms of assets and chief of staff type things, Winton was managed by Jack. And he said one of the things was is President Nixon was very 
very permissive with the former president. So when President Johnson wanted to use Air Force One to go do a, a visit or whatever, you know, the answer was going to be yes. But Jack had to deal with, with the ramifications of that permissive attitude. And so if you had someone like Jack who's handling, you know, President Bill Clinton wants to take Air Force One and fly to Japan because he's sort of the ambassador to the world. You have this whole new dynamic that's interesting as well. I, I don't necessarily have a question about that, but I just wanted to comment on that because it's interesting what Jack talks about managing those things. But, but let's get back to the first lady part of being the better part of somebody else. Who who do you think in terms of all of these first ladies brought some, I don't know, some more humanity, some more empathy to, you know, to someone who's this overachiever presidential type person who, who was someone who was Eleanor Roosevelt or, or that stands out in terms of bringing empathy to, you know, what can be a ruthless office. Yeah, th- those are all great points, Pete. And, and I think, you know, uh, uh, not necessarily from from number one uh, or or even number two, but the, the the one that the one that really stands out because he was he was more of a sort of a, a more of a businessman when it came to politics and wasn't the the handshaker or or the or the general or the leader in that sense was James and Dolly Madison. And Dolly Madison really took the role of first lady to a new level. And to Jim's point, you know, when did it when did it get out in the open? And when did people really? I mean, uh, Elizabeth Monroe was 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 kind of a quiet uh, 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 woman, and and we we find that that part of that was part of her health. We think that she may have had something along the lines of epilepsy, given a seizure that she would have had that would have kept her out of the public eye. Jefferson didn't have. A, a wife. Abigail Adams was sort of half in between uh, Massachusetts and, and half in between Washington, and she would would lend more backroom advice than than public. And of course, there aren't the, the the press conferences and the access to these people like we have today, given technology and things. But Dolly Madison, through the party and through politicking and through seating charts and who she would invite to things and the types of events she would have, she knew where business was getting done. And it wasn't through letters and it wasn't through through meetings. It was through networking. She's the first first lady that really threw big galas, big networking parties where she would have people from opposing side of the views sitting next to each other at the dinner table to work things out. And James Madison was more of a, you know, James Madison uh, uh, took notes during the entire Continental Congress. He was a a bookkeeper. He was a, a thinker and a writer, similar to Jefferson. But Jefferson liked to be out with the boys and out with the field in the in the field and exploring and and hunting and all that stuff. And 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 James Madison was was more of an intellectual and and more of a a, a homebody of sorts. And so he needed that partner to be out there and be the handshaker and the party thrower and the let's all get together and chat. And you see this happen down the line with with a, with a lot of people. Uh, they, uh, Grace Coolidge comes to mind. You know, Silent Cal was 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 not a people person. He wasn't a very friendly man. He he wasn't unfriendly. He just he was just kind of flat faced uh, with everything. And Grace Coolidge was just just smiling and 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 out and shaking hands and involved with charities and philanthropies and other things like that. Um, uh, Lucy Hayes comes to mind with with doing some of the first open and 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 uh, on sort of a new level of, of of philanthropy and charity, she would go to when her when her husband was out of the Civil War, when General um, uh, General Hayes, General Rutherford B. Hayes, becomes governor of Ohio. She would go. Lucy Hayes would go to uh, uh, veterans facilities and hospitals, mental institutions, orphanages, and she would come back and tell her husband, like, "This one's good. We need to be more like them," or "This one's bad." We need to be less like them and we need to fix them and we need to get better health. She would throw um, uh, 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 reunion picnics and, and things for for her husband's regiment and for for different battalions of the Civil War on her property, on, on her front lawn at Spiegel Grove in Fremont, Ohio. Um, this is before the term pay it forward even existed. This wasn't when it was cool to do this. She just did it because it was the right thing to do. So. Someone like Eleanor Roosevelt in our modern times, which had to physically be the legs of her husband and go out and do this, and so well known for being a humanitarian, she wouldn't be Eleanor Roosevelt if Lucy Hayes hadn't done it first. And, and that's the thing, that, that when we get to know these first ladies that, that we couldn't even name their name and know the work that they 
did that these other modern women could build on. It, it's remarkable to see how the role ha- has been instrumental and, and, and how it's transitioned over the years. It's, it's just incredible to know the type of work and the type of things that these women do. And, and we couldn't even name their names. You know, you mentioned uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and, uh, you know, and obviously every, maybe not everyone, but just about everyone knows, you know, knows her story and how important she was. It, it strikes me that Edith Roosevelt, who would have been, I'm not sure exactly cousin-in-law or aunt, I, I don't know how that in-law once removed or whatever that is, but Edith was a was a pretty interesting uh, woman in her own right, uh, as just by the fact that she was keeping up with Teddy. That I can't even imagine. Jim, you're giving half my speech for me, man. The oh, insight is sorry. remarkable. No, it's fantastic. I, I I had a I had a speech yesterday at the at the Anne Arundel D A R and and two days before that at the Mount Vernon D A R and I've asked this at a number of places once I once Volume Two came out I will ask the crowd I'll say I say Roosevelt and you say and the crowd always says Eleanor and sure. I say that's a good answer but it's the wrong answer here I want to talk about Edith because Edith is so remarkable and think of this and you've made this point. So eloquently, Edith had six children to keep up with, seven if you include Theodore Roosevelt, which I do. <laughs> he was a character. He was a rascal. He was something. So the only people that were – and I use the word people the, – the only, the, only, the only creatures, the only mammals that were allowed in Edith's private office without an appointment – were the dogs, and they had plenty. She had those kids regimented and kept ledgers at Oyster Bay, and everyone had a budget, and everyone had an account, and she had to keep track of Theodore Roosevelt. But when she comes to Washington, D.C., it's a weird time because the McKinleys had no children, and you're coming off an assassination. So the security concerns and the fact that this active, huge family with all these animals in tow, I mean, it had to look like when they stepped off the train from New York into Washington, D.C., it had to look like Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus was coming to town. And the, the, the American public and the world loved it. These were larger than life figures and kids and a family that lived in the White House. The very first thing she did was she said, there's no room for my family here. So it's Edith Roosevelt that creates the modern footprint that we look at today and brings it out of the Victorian age into the Edwardian age. Uh, no, it's the it's what it's it's the art style of what it is that the uh, that the that the Adams is the first Roosevelt the first uh, uh, inhabitants of the White House would recognize. But Edith Roosevelt creates the East Wing and the West Wing. Huh. So the physical footprint and, and it's in 1902 when she does the expansion and she hired uh, an architecture firm from New York City brought them down and she said the east wing will be for social events and that's today where state dinners are held and the west wing will be for business so if you're a big fan of the show the west wing you've got Edith Roosevelt to thank for it because <laughs> without her there would be no west wing so her impact on the white house just on the physical structure, let alone how a first lady entertains, where we entertain. And when I say entertain, I don't mean that in it, like in a lighthearted, you know, kids tea party in the backyard. Entertaining is a massive, massive component of diplomacy and how we represent ourselves to the world. I, I want to ask you about another first lady that I just frankly know nothing about. And I think it's partly because she, uh, she passed away shortly after, you know, in post-presidency. But What about Abigail Fillmore stands out? What kind of notable things, if any, did she do when she was first lady? Uh, A a lot. And and that's that's fantastic. Uh, uh, Abigail Fillmore was the shortest lived post White House first lady. Her husband died in the White House. And when she gets out of the of the of the White House, uh, she moves into the Willard Hotel where she died uh, shortly thereafter. She is she is one of the first ladies that actually taught her husband in in a, in a relatively formal setting. She's also the first first lady with a day job. She was she was a teacher when she was first married to uh, Millard uh, uh, Fillmore in, in East Aurora, New York, just outside of uh, uh, Buffalo. And um, she was a librarian and teacher, and she actually taught Millard Fillmore, uh, the other first lady that, that taught her husband, and and very informally in his tailor shop. Andrew Johnson was taught to read and write 
as an adult by his wife, Eliza Johnson. Wow. And that's a remarkable story in itself wow. uh, to think that a man who's a tailor in, uh, in Greenville, Tennessee, who couldn't read or write, was taught to read and write by his wife, would end up to be vice president and then president because of Lincoln's assassination during the Civil War, one of the most monumentous and tumultuous times in our country's history. Anyway, you asked about Abigail Fillmore. One of her significant contributions was when she got into the White House, she was amazed that there was no library. There was no library in the White House. And coming as a librarian and school teacher, this was something of interest to her. So she threw a party, invited all the congressmen and senators to the party, and walked around to each and planted the bug in the ear and said, isn't it amazing that the people's house, that the president's house doesn't have a proper library? Why wouldn't we have a library? And she got thousands of dollars, which is, which is you know, I'd like to have a few thousand dollars in cash in my pocket right now. Uh, uh, back then, it was, it was a huge Real sum money. of money. And she got it appropriated. And so she is the one that worked with the Library of Congress to then establish the first White House library. This episode of the Break It Down show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG 69 at the Break It Down show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. To then establish the first White House library. What was the uh, what was the presidency or uh, I guess the first ladyship like under Woodrow Wilson? I mean that's a interesting you know historical period. It, it very very much so, and and one that has has uh, yet to be repeated. Um, Woodrow Wilson actually had two wives. When he was elected president, his wife was Ellen Wilson. And Ellen Wilson was instrumental in his early political career in New Jersey and also becoming uh, president of uh, Princeton University, where she was first lady of Princeton University and entertained and lived in a grand house up there, which, which is still there, the Prospect House, it's called, on Princeton's campus. And Ellen Wilson died of Bright's disease, a kidney disease. She's hopefully the last of three first ladies to die while in the White House. The first was John Tyler's first wife, Letitia, died in the White House. Then um, Caroline Harrison died while she was in the White House as first lady. And then Ellen Wilson. Ellen Wilson's big contribution, there were two. One is the Rose Garden. She designed the Rose Garden. Uh, based on a garden she had at the Prospect House. And she wanted President Wilson to have a nice garden to look out the back window. So she took the White House gardener on a train up to Princeton and showed her her garden that is still there and still blooms and is kept today at the Prospect House, came home and started work on that. Unfortunately, she died uh, before it was finished, um, along with some other work that she was very interested in. She was uh, appalled at the condition of the slums and the, uh, and the uh, lesser areas of the nation's capital. So she started a, um, I forget what the, the official term for it, but it was, a, it was an improvement, a, a neighborhood Im improvement program that was later turned into a bill in her name uh, posthumously after she died because of this concern, this great concern she had for uh, minority uh, neighborhoods and, and slums and, and things of that nature in and around the nation's capital. So she did make a huge impact, even though when we think of Wilson, we think of his second wife. Mm -hmm. And the reason we do think of his second wife is because of how prominent she was. Uh, she was a widow herself, uh, married to a jeweler named Norman Galt. And the story of why she's in Washington, D.C., out of a, a, a tiny little town um, in Virginia, where she was born and, and grew up, Withville, Virginia, and she moved uh, to, to Washington, D.C. one summer. Uh, that's a great story that I, that I tell in my books. So she gets there, and she meets a jeweler and, and gets married, and then he died, and Wilson's first wife died, and because this jeweler was prominent and traveling in the circles that she traveled, she met the widower, President Woodrow Wilson. They fell in love. They got married. And then the most significant occurrence in the Wilson administration was he had a stroke. He went out of commission and they they kept it from the public. They kept it from the American public for months on end. If you can imagine, you know, if we don't see our president every 24 hours, whether he's 
you know, uh, uh, get, getting, a, getting a happy meal, you know, walking across the South Lawn or playing with his dog or getting a slushy or, or, you know, getting into the helicopter or driving across town or speaking in the Rose Garden or the, or the, you know, anywhere. We don't see him. We get very nervous. President Wilson had a debilitating stroke that basically paralyzed half of his body and he went into seclusion. But they staged interviews and released things to the press that made him seem as though he were active and well. Um, there was even a plan to retire that did not please Mrs. Wilson. This would be Edith Wilson, his second wife. And I've seen the papers from the doctors and from White House staff. And I can tell you without a doubt, Ellen Wilson was running the country as the first unofficial female president while her husband was in poor health. It's just it's just a fact. I've right. seen the letters. I've seen the things that she approved. She would charge or come back with. She was just managing the president's business, but everything had the president's stamp of approval and saw his eyes. But if you take it down and boil it to the to the bare bones of just the fact that nothing made it into the president's bedroom without going through her hands and her eyes first, that's run in the country in my eyes. Sure. I, I have to, I'm sure you're asked this question a million times, uh, but you know, but it's a good question. So I'll, I'll be the millions and one <laughs> who's your favorite who's your favorite first lady and and why yeah i and you and you're right you you are about a million and one and and it's funny cuz i just said this the other day too you would think having asked been asked that question as many times as i have i would have a better answer <laughs> <laughs> but 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 this this is the way i i, I break it down i i mean i i, I know too much you know to to pick the first one to pick up to pick a favorite one rather because they've all They've all done something that is so remarkable, uh, and even the ones that didn't do anything, the circumstances under which they didn't do something are, are equally remarkable to me, and I want to know more about that and why. But when I break it down in centuries, my favorite first lady of the 1700s is Abigail Adams, and it's because in the 1700s, she wrote to her husband when he was constructing the, 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 the First Continental Congress, she said, remember the ladies. Mm. A lot of people know that phrase associated with Abigail Adams, but what they don't know are the words that surround it in that letter. And I've held that letter because they have the letter at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And in that letter, Abigail Adams wrote to her husband, the first vice president of the United States, remember the ladies, for when you have them on your side, the men will be in your favor. Mm. That's a very interesting statement from a woman hundreds of years before she would vote hundreds of years before electricity, before TV, before mass communication, mass transit. What she's saying was, is that I, I modernize it in my speeches. And I say, you know, if you're sitting at home, like today, a lot of people are sitting at home watching, watching football, watching, watching playoffs, going to watch the Super Bowl. Men are holding the remotes. Men sit in the living room and hold the remote control. But men aren't picking the shows. <laughs> and, and that's what Abigail Adams was saying. Because if a husband comes home in the 1700s and says, honey, the election is tomorrow and I'm going to vote for John Adams. And she says, that's a dumb move. <laughs> the husband thinks, okay, that is a dumb move. But if he comes home and says, I'm voting for John Adams. And his wife says, that's the smartest thing you've done since I met you. He goes down to the corner tavern. He buys a, a pint of grog for all of his friends. And he says, I'm the smartest guy in town. You know why, fellas? My wife said so. <laughs> <laughs> and he knows that even in colonial times, hundred revolutionary times, hundreds of years before they would vote, hundreds of years before proper education, formal education, before they were legally allowed to own land, drive cars, any of the other stuff, men were holding the remotes, but women were picking the shows. <laughs> she knew the influence of women, and she gave her husband that advice, and it was sound advice. So she's a progressive thinker even in today's times because we still struggle with gender issues. In the 1800s, my favorite is Lou Hoover. And that's because of the reasons I mentioned. She did things that no other women were doing. She went out and she knew that veterans and orphans of the Civil War needed extra help. She knew that the mentally ill needed to be properly cared for. We are still struggling with those things today. And she tried to get ahead of that. She tried to solve that problem. In, 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 the, in, the, in the 1900s, and this is probably if I had to pick one, and if my feet were held to the fire, I would say Lou Hoover. The Hoover's are the saddest case in American history of being at the right place at the wrong time. Hmm. They are probably the two most capable 
and most remarkable human beings that have ever lived in the White House and been president and first lady, given their past experiences, their life achievements. He's the first. The Hoover is the first of now three administrations not to take a salary. The money that he pulled out of his own pocket to bring uh, uh, foreign diplomats and their families out of uh, London and Europe before the outbreak of World War I, when the U.S. government and State Department couldn't get them out in time. The schools that they built for children that didn't have schools, the college educations they paid for for children in the, in the Appalachian Mountains near where their vacation home was. Lou Hoover spoke seven different languages, had been around the world multiple times by the time she gets into the presidency. She helped start the Girl Scouts. She, she uh, 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 was the first woman to graduate in America with a geology degree from Stanford University. Uh, she's just an incredible, remarkable woman. And the good, the good deeds and philanthropic endeavors and, and, and charities that she engaged in and just doing things for it because it was the right thing to do because she had made her own privilege in life. She wasn't from a, a wealthy family and Hoover was an orphan, uh, bounced around from, from uncle to uncle. Yeah, it's just a remarkable story that the Hoovers and to think that so much potential and the things they could have done if they had come in four years earlier or four years later and avoided the Great Depression because the Hoovers did not cause and no president or first lady could have solved the Great Depression in, in one term. So I, I always go with the Hoovers on, on that call. Let, let me ask you this, because you're talking about an important thing and you're a de facto presidential historian because – you are the first lady historian. So we know one thing about presidents is, is it, you know, and whenever I see people promoting a particular candidate, like on how qualified they are, we know that qualifications don't correlate positively to success or failure. It's just, it's just not a good indicator of it. But is it a good, is, is pedigree a good indicator of first lady success? Or, and, or maybe, uh, maybe the question I want to ask is, do we need more homespun type people, self-made people to be the president slash first lady because they have come from somewhere impossible to get to the uh, presidency? W what are your thoughts on either one of those things? Oh, my gosh, Pete, that's 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 a fantastic that's a fantastic question. It it delves a little bit into places where I avoid because I can't be political. I can't I have to ride down that the, the middle lane like like no other because because all of these first ladies are my favorites. And I I very intentionally don't know uh, what political party all of them were because I, I'm, I'm not interested in, in that. So so speaking very, very generically, um, I, I think that these that these homespun, these self-made success stories do tend to be the best presidents and, and first ladies. I don't know how much of that we can truly get anymore in our modern times, given that, that presidential elections cost uh, millions, potentially billions of dollars in advertising and campaigning and, and travel and such to do. We've just we've outgrown that that more uh, modest president and, and first lady. It's, it's interesting because these women, as I stated before, they are the most powerful and influential unelected and unpaid women in the world. And it's just because they happen to marry some guy who happened to run for president and happened to win the nomination and then win the election. So, I mean, the, the odds, you know, nobody listening to this podcast will be president or first lady. The odds are against you. you, you you've got greater odds. It's, it's, it's easier for you to get eaten by a shark, struck by lightning, or, or win the lottery than become Wait, president. What does this do, what does this do for, for Pete's uh, campaign, though? Pete, this, <laughs> I've already, I've I've already I'm, said I'm ineligible. I'm still voting for, for you. I'm still voting for you. Well, I appreciate the support. <laughs> well, again, this is a broad stroke, so take it all with a grain of salt. Pete can still win, and he's got my vote. That's oh for my sure. God. Um, but, but 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 it is interesting to think that that to be a good first lady, you just have to, well a lot comes in 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 time and circumstance. You know, uh, technological advances. Jacqueline Kennedy is the only first lady to win an Emmy award because technology was in her favor. She was a great lady. I'm not taking anything away from her, but she was also in the right place at the right time for that kind of recognition. Where Lou Hoover was in the wrong place at the wrong time because no one remembers Lou Hoover for Girl Scout cookies or starting the Girl Scouts or being the first first lady to be a president of the Girl Scouts and, and all the good things that she, she did. But everyone knows Jacqueline Kennedy because she was on TV doing it. Um, uh, when, when, you think of, when you think of 
artifacts and uh, history and the museum quality and the historical uh, landmark that the White House is uh, federally appropriated. So because Jacqueline did it, you don't know that Pat Nixon collected more artifacts and antiques for the White House collection than any other first lady in history. Um, it, it's, it's weird, but, but life is their only experience. Life is their only teacher. If you come from the very privileged background that Jacqueline Kennedy did, and, and that's what teaches you to, to be that good person and have that uh, charitable mind or that philanthropic push that, she, that Jacqueline Kennedy did and was taught from the very beginning, you know, great. Or if it's the fact that you're Dolly Madison and you'd never been out of the country and your father was a ne'er-do-well that couldn't really put two dimes together if, if, he, if he tried and you just ended up in a place where, where your first husband died of yellow fever and you ended up meeting James Madison and, 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 and put on a turban and, and never looked back to, to, to your little modest house in Philadelphia or where you grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina, well, then, then that's the best experience. But it's, it's an interesting role in that we expect so much out of them, but they aren't elected, they aren't paid, so they don't, they, they don't have to do anything. And, and there's no First Ladies 101. You can't major in First Ladies in college. Right. So it, it's, it's really a crapshoot what you're getting in a First Lady. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting to, to see how each of these First Ladies made the role their own while still taking the influence and the foundation that was laid from number one, Martha Washington, and, and using that to, to move the role forward. Yeah, you know, from now, this, that's something that I you know, had never thought of before, but uh, every uh, mint Girl Scout cookie that I eat now, I'll have to think of a Lou Hoover. Yeah. Yeah. And and, uh, and I'm a dosy dough man myself. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when I when I when I sit down and I eat an entire box in one sitting, then yeah. that makes me kind of not like Lou Hoover so much. But, you know, <laughs> I go back and forth on that. Let, let, let me throw. I want to throw it back. Just a, a, a writing question. Uh, just to you know, back. Wait. Do you do you consider wh which do you like more? I mean, do you like researching? You know, it. I mean, obviously, you've done so much research. I mean, is that more? You know, you know, does that bring more joy or or whatever to you than than the actual writing, or is vice versa? Is it fifty fifty? What What's the process like for you? It, it's 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 kind of what day I'm on, you know. It, it it's it's how I wake up in the morning. I, I will say this: the reason why I gravitated to the C-SPAN series in the beginning, and what attracted me to it, and what still attracts me to this first ladies, is travel and adventure. Nothing beats hands-on out there, going into the the crypts, going into the closets, the attics, digging through the boxes. I mean, that's that's where my my heart and my passion lie. Um, that being said, I, I joked with a number of my author friends, and Jim, I, I'm sure you can probably relate to this. It, it's much cooler to have written a book than be writing a book. Um, and, and now I can say that twice. While, while I do love the process, and I, I further romanticized it given my, my subject matter, I, I, I always had candles lit in the room when I was writing. It just took me back to a place, and I, and I used multiple locations hmm. for inspiration. And I, I, I sequestered myself away from electricity and, and, and modern conveniences of home at a, at a cabin out in Deep Creek Lake that my family owns uh, to do a considerable amount of writing. But then I sat here in, in you know, just outside of Washington, D.C., and, and wrote in my dining room. Um, it, it, writing is a remarkably therapeutic and a remarkably rewarding process, but the interesting thing is, it's not like going to, uh, let, let's say that you worked at, at a retail store. You go there and you fold clothes and you sell clothes and you go home. When you wake up a writer, you can't always just write, you know, unless you want to write garbage. And, and, and I could put as many uh, uh, time frames and, and goals and, and deadlines on myself that I wanted, but if I wasn't feeling it, and I wasn't writing it, then it then it wouldn't come. So so that's a very interesting twist. I will say the the combination of all of it and the culmination into this first lady's man uh, persona and career that I have, my my absolute favorite thing to do through all of this. Once once the research is done, 
once the, the, the books are written and things, when I go out and I speak to a crowd and I take those questions and answers and I get to interact with people, then I get to travel. I get to learn new things. Like I, after I, after the series and after I wrote volume one, I went down to Greensboro, North Carolina, where Dolly Madison's from. I got to see a whole new collection with a wonderful set of artifacts. I've got all kinds of stuff to expand the Dolly Madison chapter in the next uh, uh, edition, the next version of, of, of my book. And I got to talk to people and I got to, to teach people and I got to amaze people with, with, with these amazing stories of these women. And I get to interact face to face and I get to be in a different state and, and, and travel and do all that stuff. So it, it's such a, it's such a thrilling and rewarding process from beginning to end. And, and without one, there wouldn't be the other. This, it wouldn't be as fun to speak to people if I didn't have a book that I'd written and I wouldn't be able to write the book if I hadn't done the research. So the whole the whole journey, the whole adventure is so integrated and integral to each other that, that the symbiotic nature of it, it just, just, just makes it, I'm just having the time of my life. I'm having the absolute time of my life. What are, are you working on a new project? Is that, uh, is what else is in the wind for you? Well, I, I do do other things. I, I, you know, I'm still a television producer. I'm still a multimedia producer. I work um, uh, for a number of different clients and in a number of different ways. But as far as first ladies man goes, um, th they make new first ladies every four to eight years. And, 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 and I haven't finished researching the ones that, 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 that have already been. I need to go to Mamie Eisenhower's birthplace in Boone, Iowa. I need to get to the Carter Center in Atlanta because I went to Plains, Georgia to get to know uh, Rosalind in a, in a more intimate way. Um, uh, I went to Fayetteville, Arkansas for the same reason. I wanted to know the things that no one knows about Hillary Clinton instead of going to the, the Clinton Museum in, in Little Rock. The Obamas don't even have their library yet. You, you know, in 2020, that'll open in Chicago. And hopefully uh, that'll that'll be another trip to Hawaii for me that I can write off. Because well, there'll be a, a, <laughs> one, in, one in Maui would be fantastic or somewhere in Hawaii, the Big Island. I don't care. Anywhere out there. Uh, you know, and then the Trumps have only just begun. And by the time the Trumps are finished and I'm going back looking at the Obamas and other things like other women like that, um, the, the, the new first lady will be in with, with new thoughts or first gentleman will open up a whole new realm of stuff. So, I, you know, I've, I've got some ideas about some other things that, that are relatable to first ladies and politics and, and presidents, given given where I, I live and, and what I've done thus far with the first ladies. But the, the first ladies they're 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 never going to go out of style and girl power and, and and women women leadership and all that stuff just keeps gaining momentum uh year after year after year and and, and i'm i'm very happy being the first ladies man until i don't want to be that anymore so let's make sure everybody has one more chance to know that your your website the first ladies man.com is where you go to get all this information your tour dates tons and tons and tons of material there videos and everything else and man it's just awesome like i just want to have you on all the time to talk about it and, and figure <laughs> out you know because like i've just got and, and i know jim does too but i've just got like 15 more questions like i want to ask you like who's the undiscovered first lady if not lou hoover and you know who did we not get enough from because it was I just over and over and over again it's all these great questions so one from all of us out here in humanity thank you for doing what you're doing because it is important work and these are important ladies and you know it's, it's easy to uh it's easy to put up something hateful about our first lady because you don't like her politically, but then you have to deal with the reality of what they actually contributed in their life. And you're giving those, those ladies a choice, you know, and, and it's just, it's just an incredible body of work, man. And I love your passion for it. Clearly listening to like your rate of speech and your inflection and you love doing this. And, and how can I, how, how can Jim and I not shine a light on your fantastic work? So at least as far as me for this, I'm good. And I'll, I'll leave it to Jim to close out his portion, but seriously, Seriously, anytime, come on the show. Let's talk about it. If you ever want to co-host something, if you want to go grab Rosalind Carter and do a podcast with me, I'm all about it. But um, thank you again, and I, I really appreciate it. Jim? I, I actually, yeah, I'd uh, echo all of that. And let's uh, let's have Andrew you know, one more time. Give us a URL for that website. And listen, kids, go there, read it. If you're going to quote the guy, make sure you're giving him credit. Better yet, <laughs> buy the book. 
I, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll leave you with this, and this is something that will tease up the next thing that we can talk about, and I, I would love to come back anytime. Melania Trump and Michelle Obama share something that, that's, that's both amazing and, and, and actually kind of sad at the same time because of what it's developed into, but these are the first two true social media first ladies. The, the last first lady that had, as politics become more divisive, and I bring this up, Pete, because you did, uh, uh, as, as politics become more partisan year after year, election after election, Laura Bush was the last first lady where people really had definite thoughts, either love him or hate him about her husband, but they still all loved Laura Bush right. because – these first ladies aren't elected and because they're not paid and because we had this understanding of they're just trying to make the world a better place. But Michelle Obama and Melania Trump are in the middle of something that's just it's just a horrible element of, of what our society and what our world has become is that people can hide behind their social media platforms and say things that people take to be true. People believe they're they're un, they're unverified they're unsubstantiated. It's it's opinion. It's mean spirited. And when people don't like Barack Obama, they look at Michelle and they see Barack Obama. And when people don't like Donald Trump, they look at Melania Trump and they don't see Melania Trump. Well, guess what? Michelle Obama and Melania Trump are wonderful people that did wonderful thing in an almost impossible situation of being on that world stage in that position. Michelle Obama wanted to get kids healthy and feed them right and get them exercising. And Melania Trump wants people not to be bullied and to keep people off drugs and want people to do their best. Those are admirable qualities and those are admirable things. And if we all followed in their footsteps, I think the world would be a better place. But people are spending so much time worrying about what they're wearing or how high their heels are or how high their heels aren't or, 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 or just a bunch of other garbage that's just not true. And it's just being mean for the sake of being mean because you can because you've got this smartphone and you've got this Facebook account or Twitter account. That, that it, it's, just, it's just a horrible uh, uh, development in things. But, but I, I try and shed a light on the positive, even through the social media era, which I have embraced. I mean, it's how I'm talking to you now. It's, it's how uh, so many, many of my books are, are used. But, but it's an unfortunate uh, 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 side effect that has plagued, I think, both of our most recent first ladies. And it's, it's something I'd like to see turn around. And I'd like to see people start, start uh, uh, being unusual for their time. And, and uh, if you don't have something nice to say about someone, then, then don't say anything at all. These women um, are, are not paid. They're not elected, and they're trying to make the world a better place, and I'm taking a page out of their playbook and, and trying to do the same. And I know you guys are by putting on programs like this, so I appreciate you guys uh, uh, having me on and giving me the time. 